All right, verse 3. Notice what Jude writes here. He says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we're so thankful for who you are. We're thankful for all that you've done in our lives. We're thankful for this church and that we can gather together here in this place and worship you and now turn our attention to the scriptures. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would minister to our hearts and our minds now as we consider your word. Teach us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have you ever tried to talk to a non-Christian friend about God or the Bible only to have your words blown out of the sky with an objection like there isn't any good evidence that God exists or religions, including Christianity, are responsible for most of the world's wars, suffering and atrocities? Or people say the God of the Old Testament commanded the Israelites to commit genocide. How could you believe in a God like that? Or they say the Bible condones slavery. It oppresses women. It promotes hatred of homosexuals. Many critics of Christianity today have an arsenal of these kinds of conversation-halting objections ready to unload at the first inkling, someone's about to talk to them about Jesus or the Bible. Have you bumped into any of these kinds of objections in real life conversations with people? If you've tried to share the gospel with people in the 21st century, you're familiar with these kinds of objections. They regularly come up in conversations with people. Question for you, when you bump into this kind of pushback, do you feel that you're prepared in those moments to contend earnestly for the faith? What is Jude saying here when he instructs us to contend earnestly for the faith? Well, let's break it down. The word contend literally means to fight. That word earnestly means seriously or intensely, and that phrase, the faith, refers to the whole body of revealed truth contained in the Bible. So Jude here, writing under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, instructs Christians to put up a fight for the truth of God's Word. But please don't misunderstand Jude. He's not encouraging us to get into physical fights with people. <laughs> no, don't do that. We're instructed in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, to live peaceably with all. Paul said, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We're not to be getting into fist fights with people over theological disagreements. God wants us to be a peaceable people, living peacefully with people. So when Jude instructs us to contend earnestly for the faith, he's talking primarily about countering the errors, the misconceptions and false teachings about God, not with fists and guns, but with truth. With truth. So contending for the, the faith really is just speaking the truth, speaking the truth, answering people's questions about God, answering their objections to Jesus, responding to their criticisms about the Bible. But that's not always easy to do, is it? It, it often takes preparation and study ahead of time to have those kinds of answers that you want ready to roll off the tip of your tongue. Well, what I'd like to do in our time together this morning is respond to some of these popular objections that atheists and skeptics are bringing up today and just offer some concise responses that I hope will not only encourage you but leave you a little bit better equipped to talk to your non-Christian coworkers and friends and family members who bring up these kinds of problems and questions and conversations. The first objection I'd like to address for a couple of minutes concerns the topic of slavery in the Bible. It's not uncommon to hear atheists say that the Bible condones slavery and only evil, selfish men would ever concoct a book like that. How might we respond to that? 
Well, when someone brings this up with me, I like to point out to them that slavery was never part of God's original plan for humanity, and it wouldn't exist if it weren't for mankind's sin. The Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself in the Old and New Testaments. We're also instructed to regard one another as more important than ourselves. Slavery wouldn't exist anywhere on the planet if people loved one another that way. A loving person doesn't kidnap people, lock them up, and force them to work without pay. That's terribly cruel and evil, and the biblical writers knew that. Kidnapping is a sin that carried the death penalty in the Old Testament. For example, Exodus 21, verse 16 says, Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. There would probably be a lot fewer kidnappings today if kidnappers, when found guilty, were swiftly put to death. But, of course, we've done away with the death penalty in many states, including here in California, and society is paying the price. The sex slave trade is out of control here in our country right now. And one of the reasons why is there's not a fear among the traders. You know, maybe a year or two in prison, but the profits are too lucrative. Be that as it may, another verse that made it clear kidnapping people in the Bible and forcing them to be slaves is wrong is found in Deuteronomy 24, verse 7. It says there, if anyone kidnaps a fellow Israelite and treats him as a slave or sells him, God says the kidnapper must die. In this way, you will purge the evil from among you. So the Old Testament made it clear that these activities were wrong, kidnapping people, selling them, treating them as slaves. What about the New Testament, though? Does it take a softer stand on slavery? No, not at all. In fact, in the New Testament, enslavers, men stealers, or slave traders, depending on your translation, are condemned alongside murderers in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. So then why do some people believe that the Bible condones slavery? Well, I think it's because the Bible does have a handful of verses wherein God instructed the Israelites on how they were to treat their servants. In biblical times, people could sell themselves to be servants. You couldn't sell someone else. That was a death penalty sin. But if you were indebted to somebody for thousands of dollars, you could sell yourself to that person or that family for a certain allotted amount of time to be their servant to pay off your debt. This is discussed in Leviticus 25 and elsewhere, and that practice was very common. So for those servants' sake, God gave the Israelites instructions on how they were to treat their servants. The instructions are actually given to protect and help the servants, not harm them or keep them down. Paul in the New Testament summarized the Bible's instructions regarding servants with these words in Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. He said, Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So servants were to be treated justly and fairly. The Bible never encouraged or condoned the horrific kind of slavery that involved kidnapping, selling, and mistreating humans. You won't find that in the Bible. Well, Charlie, our our friend says, the God of the Bible commanded the Israelites to kill the Canaanites in the book of Joshua. A loving God would never do that. If someone brings this up with you, you might ask him this question. Have you read the Old Testament passages regarding the Canaanites? Often they haven't. They've just heard about the supposed genocide. If they do say they've read the book of Joshua, you might ask this question. Do you recall what the Canaanites were doing that brought God's judgment on them? I can assure you of this. The answer will almost always be no. So then you might then lovingly, humbly bring the person up to speed a bit on what the Canaanites were doing at the time of Joshua. The Bible tells us that they were an exceedingly wicked people who were sacrificing their children by fire to their god, Molech. 
The Bible also tells us that they were committing incest, adultery, polygamy, bestiality, witchcraft, and a variety of other abominable customs. So the Canaanites had become a dangerous, cancerous threat, not only to their posterity and their neighbors, but to the Israelites. So God brought the Israelite military in to put an end to the wickedness, just as centuries later, he would bring down the Assyrians and then the Babylonians to put a stop to the wickedness when the Israelites began engaging in the exact same activities. Peter said in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, God is not one to show partiality. He doesn't show favoritism. He brought judgment on the Canaanites, and he brought judgment on the Israelites as well. Friends, God created the earth, as you know, and all of its inhabitants. So he has the right to do whatever he seems best with his creation. All of life belongs to him. Think back to World War II. Most of us believe that the allied powers, which included the United States, had the right and even God's approval to go to war against Nazi Germany and Japan to put a stop to the great evils they were committing. When President Trump came into office in 2017, he authorized our military to put a stop to these guys, ISIS. Remember them? Remember some of the evil things they were doing? Burning people alive in cages and all of that? I think regardless of a person's politics, most Americans were in favor of military intervention against this group. Well, this raises a question then. If human governments have the right to send in a military force to put a stop to evildoers, doesn't God have the right? Surely he does. If our non-Christian friends today who are critical of the Bible had lived at the time of Joshua and were aware of the great atrocities going on in the land of Canaan, I think many of them would have been in favor of God's intervention. I do find it a bit odd that atheists today commonly say if God exists, he should intervene and put a stop to evil and suffering. But in the next breath, they point to the book of Joshua where we actually have an example of God putting a stop to some of the evil and atheists say loving God would never do that. I don't know, it seems to me that no matter what God does, people who want nothing to do with him find fault. Had he just allowed the evil to fester there in the land of Canaan, they'd have a problem with that. If he puts a stop to it, they have a problem with it, really mainly because they just want nothing to do with God. Well, surely God doesn't even exist. If he did, he'd just appear to to us in a public setting and prove it to the world. People who raise this objection overlook the fact that God has already done this when he came to the earth in the person of Jesus. He raised the dead, healed cripples, opened the eyes of the blind, proved he was God in the flesh. And what happened? Did everyone repent and believe in him? No, they led him away and put him to death on a cross. One of the reasons God doesn't appear to people today is because he knows that wouldn't change their hearts. And God knows that he's already provided enough evidence for his existence for those who truly want to know him. What evidence, someone asks? How about the fine-tuning of the universe? or the mind-boggling complexity of living organisms or the information we've discovered and encoded into DNA? or hundreds of fulfilled prophecies in the Bible, or the historical evidence for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, just for starters. I agree with Norman Geisler, a tremendous Bible scholar who went to be with the Lord a couple of years ago. He said this, he said, God has provided enough evidence in this life to convince anyone willing to believe, yet, He has also left some ambiguity so as not to compel the unwilling. In this way, God gives us the opportunity to either love him or to reject him without violating our freedom, end quote. I so agree with that. I also concur with J.P. Moreland, a well-known Christian philosopher. He was interviewed by Lee Strobel a while back, and he said something similar. I think he's worth quoting here. He said, God maintains a delicate balance between keeping his existence sufficiently evident 
so people will know he's there and yet hiding his presence enough so that people who want to choose to ignore him can do it. This way, their choice of destiny is really free, end quote. God is so wise. There's enough evidence out there for anyone who wants to know him, and yet he's hidden enough so that if you hate him and freely want to go your way, you're able to do that. All right, moving along. Another objection I've been hearing more lately has to do with the size of the universe. Atheists say the universe is so vast, it's foolish to think a God built a universe billions of light years across just to have a personal relationship with you. In other words, it's absurd to think that God would create all these other stars and galaxies and planets if the focus of his love was really just right here on our tiny planet. Well, in response to that, I would first note that the enormity of something has absolutely no bearing on whether or not God exists, for God could have several good reasons for creating the universe the way he did, including the knowledge that his creatures would find a sky full of stars quite beautiful. That could be sufficient reason in itself. God just wanted you to walk outside on a clear, dark night and be blown away by the beauty of the stars. I think in reality, the enormity of the universe with all of its galaxies and stars proves to be more of a problem for atheists. Why is that? Well, because the world's leading atheistic authors and philosophers believe every star, planet, and galaxy in the cosmos sprang into existence from what Richard Dawkins and Stephen Hawking said was literally nothing. Nothing. Friend, that requires an enormous amount of faith. We all know from practical experience that nothing can't do anything, let alone turn itself into things like stars and planets and all the different matter we find throughout the universe. Well, Charlie, the Bible was written by men. It's not trustworthy. It's almost comical to me today how often I see this objection come up in you know, social media exchanges between people. And the, the, the non-Christian thinks that if he can just point out to the Christian that the Bible was written by men, we can get the Bible out of the conversation. As though Christians, that, like that's going to be a big revelation to us. Like we didn't know that the Bible was written by men because they hear us referring to it as God's Word. And we, be- we do believe it's God's Word. The Bible makes that clear, that all Scripture is inspired by God. It's God-breathed. But he used human instruments to pin down the different books of the Bible. We know that. But they think if they can just point out to you that it was written by men, you'll agree with them that it can't be trustworthy because men make mistakes all the time. Well, I like to lovingly point out to people who raise this objection that their conclusion does not follow logically from their premise. If what men write is not trustworthy, we'd have to throw out encyclopedias, dictionaries, automobile manuals, everything the IRS sends us. (laughs) Written by men. (laughs) Throw it out. Men are capable of communicating truthfully, especially when they have God's help, as we know the biblical authors did. Many today who hold to this skeptical view of the Bible and think that it's just an ancient compilation of legends and myths overlook the fact that there's actually a wealth of evidence for the Bible's trustworthiness. I have here in mind things like uh, hundreds of fulfilled prophecies, thousands of archaeological discoveries, the Bible's incredible internal harmony. Historical confirmation we've discovered in the ancient records of the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Romans. There's lots of scientific discoveries that have verified details in the Bible. There was a discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls back in 1947, which give us the assurance we have accurate copies of the ancient books of the Bible. There's the writings of historians outside of the Bible, like Flavius Josephus and Cornelius Tacitus, who verified dozens of details for us in the Bible. If you're unfamiliar with this kind of evidence for the Bible, our website, alwaysbeready.com, has lots of articles on this. I've written books on this subject. There's lots of help 
available to you today if you could use some encouragement. But let's move along. Another objection that skeptics bring up today has to do with Constantine, an ancient Roman emperor. They say after Roman, the Roman emperor Constantine became a Christian in AD 312, the Roman Empire took control of the Bible and tampered with its contents to better control the people. In other words, even if the Bible was once trustworthy, it's not now because the Roman Empire messed with the contents. There was a fictional novel that came out in 2003 called The Da Vinci Code. I'm sure some of you remember it. It was a runaway bestseller. It's that book on the screen that popularized this objection. Well, the claim is totally fabricated. There's no evidence to support it. This was a fictional novel. This was completely made up. If someone tells you that Constantine got his hands on the contents of the Bible and tampered with the contents, you might ask them this question, how did you come to that conclusion? They've probably forgotten that they read the Da Vinci Code and just swallowed this as fact. But what evidence, I'm curious, what evidence led you to conclude that the Roman Empire tampered with the contents of the Bible? If you'll ask the person that question, I can guarantee you this, 99.9% .9 of the instances, you will get a blank stare back. Why is that? Because there's not a shred of evidence that the Roman Empire tampered with even one book of the Bible. And the ancient handwritten manuscript copies of the Bible that predate the time of Constantine prove this to be the case. What do I mean? Well, we know what the Old and New Testament said in their entirety before Constantine was even born around A.D. 280. And when we compare the Bible we have and use today to those ancient manuscript copies of the Bible, we see that it says the same thing it said all the way back in the first, second, and third centuries. Well, Charlie, the New Testament author stole the whole idea for Jesus' virgin birth and resurrection from ancient religions that were around prior to Christianity. There's a video that's been circulating out there on the Internet now for several years called Zeitgeist. This low-budget video produced by a young man by the name of Peter Joseph has now been viewed by millions of people. And many viewers, unaware of its errors, have had their confidence in the Gospels undermined by watching it. I know this from firsthand experience. Several families have emailed our ministry uh, to talk about the fact that their, you know, high school age son or daughter who was walking with the Lord, raised in a Christian church, watched 30 minutes of a Zeitgeist video, has renounced their faith and won't come to church anymore. That's how... I mean, th this video, you can look it up sometime if you want. Zeitgeist, you'll find it right away. It's on YouTube. It is a satanic masterpiece of deception. And it has been wrecking havoc now for several years. The video alleges that the New Testament authors plagiarized major details for Jesus' life from earlier sources, other religions that were around before the rise of Christianity. For example, the Zeitgeist video says the gospel writers stole the idea for a virgin giving birth to a child from the ancient religion of Mithraism. Well, I happen to know a few things about ancient religions. I've taught college-level courses on world religions, and I've researched the ancient Persian religion of Mithraism. And the myths say that Mithras, the deity, that's the, the name of the deity in Mithraism, arose spontaneously from a rock inside a cave. Does that sound like a virgin birth to you? No. To suggest that the gospel writers plagiarized the virgin birth for Mithraism is a preposterous claim, but the man who made this video knew that most people have never even heard of Mithraism, and they're not going to take the time to even investigate the claim. Friends, the virgin birth of the Messiah was not plagiarized for Mithraism. It was actually the fulfillment of a prophecy given in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, six or 700 years before Jesus' birth. And many Bible commentators believe the virgin birth of the Messiah was prophesied as far back as Genesis chapter 3, where God seems to indicate that the coming Messiah would be born to a woman apart from a relationship with a man. But what about Jesus' resurrection? 
Did the New Testament authors steal the idea for the resurrection as well as the zeitgeist video claims? No. Jesus' resurrection wasn't borrowed from some other religion. It was the fulfillment of prophecies made by Jewish prophets as far back as a thousand years before Christ. David, writing around 1,000 B.C., and the prophet Isaiah, prophesying around 700 B.C., both foretold the coming Messiah's resurrection. They prophesied it would happen long before Jesus was even born. So you can be confident that the New Testament authors didn't plagiarize any of their ideas for Jesus' life uh, from these sources outside of the Bible. All right, moving along. Another objection that we're hearing more today has to do with the Bible's teaching on homosexuality. Critics of Christianity point out that Jesus said to love people, even your enemies. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, Christians' rejection of homosexuals is downright hateful. Well, I think it's important to point out to people that we certainly do not hate people who identify as homosexuals or lesbians. Uh, many of us have a family member, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor who identify as such, and we love these people. The Christian view towards same-gender sexual behavior should not be viewed or understood to mean that Christians reject or hate the people engaging in that behavior. My wife and I have five kids. We've been married for 26 years, and we view some of their behavior unfavorably. And occasionally I'll tell my kids that. I'll say, what you're doing is sinful. This is not something the Lord uh, will bless. Okay, question for you. Does that mean I hate my child? Of course not. I tell them that because I love them and I want to see them align their lives with God's will, that God might bless them and lead them into a life that's going to be a blessing to others. But disagreeing with them over an activity does not equal hatred. If disagreeing equaled hatred, our critics would be guilty of the very behavior they accuse us of, hatred, because they disagree with us on a variety of things. So we distinguish between the person and the practice. It's only same gender sexual activity we're opposed to, not the persons engaging in that activity. We still are called by God to love them. They're humans made in the image of God, and we can show them that love. But it doesn't mean we can applaud of all their activities. We also disapprove of fornication and adultery, all kinds of other things, drunkenness, lying, stealing. There's all kinds of activities that we cannot applaud. The world wants you to think, though, if you don't applaud anything that anyone wants to do, that you're a bigot, you're hateful. Well, we don't buy that. They're, they're trying to pressure us into approving of things God has disapproved of. Well, why do you Christians persist in judging people when Jesus said not to judge? If there's one verse in the Bible that everyone on the planet seems to have committed to memory, it's John chapter 7, verse 24 where Jesus said, do not judge. You're familiar with the verse. Let me put the verse for you, though, up on the screen. Let's put the whole verse up. Notice what Jesus said. He says, do not judge. Is there a period there? No, he, he's not done. <clears throat> he says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Would you look at that? Jesus didn't forbid judging, and I'm glad he didn't. Friends, you'd be dead today if you weren't regularly making judgments about where to go, what to eat, who to befriend, what to keep a safe distance from, and God knows that. So Jesus says, judge, but judge righteously. Don't, don't just make some flippant judgment. You know, by, uh, based on, the, on appearance, the way they're dressed or that kind of a thing. But, but be careful when you make judgments. How do we do that? Well, Christians consult with what God has revealed in the Bible, and then we carefully try to align our view 
our assessment of a person or activity with what the Bible says and seeing that God has declared certain activities good and others sinful, Christians can rightly call those activities what God calls them. That's making a good judgment. Well, Charlie, the Bible is oppressive and harmful to women. If someone tells you this, you might ask the person this question. Have you studied the Bible? Now, watch your tone. I'm not encouraging you to be snarky here. But if the person says, yes, I have studied the Bible, and that's how I've come to that conclusion, then you might follow up with this question. What passages did you find most oppressive? Tell me about them. And see what the person says. I've been reading and studying the Bible for 30 years. And after much study, I've come to the conclusion that the God of the Bible loves and cherishes women. Husbands, that's a good place to say amen right here. This brother got it. <laughs> Bonus points in the front here. He's like, amen. <laughs> but who cares what I think? Millions of women all over the world who read the Bible on a daily basis have also come to that same conclusion that the God of the Bible loves and cherishes women. They've understood that the Bible says men and women are both made in the image of God and are equally valuable and important to God. They've read Paul's instructions for husbands to love their wives even as Jesus loves them and was willing to lay down his life on the cross for their sins. They've read the passages where men are told to do nothing from selfishness and to even consider women to be more important than themselves. They've read about the friendships Jesus had with women like Mary and Martha and how he healed several women. They've read about women like Ruth, Deborah, Priscilla, and others who are portrayed in a wonderful light. And they've understood that the Bible condemns activities that hurt women, like physical and emotional abuse, adultery, abandoning one's wife, and rape. Friends, if more people followed Jesus' teachings in the Bible, the world would be a much better place today for women. You can be sure of that. All right, let's look at a couple more. How about this one? People say religions, Christianity included, are responsible for most of the world's wars, suffering, and atrocities. Unfortunately, religious terrorists, greedy televangelists, child molesting priests, and others have done things that are terribly hurtful to people. But there are two things I think critics of Christianity overlook when they raise this objection. First, Jesus and his teachings are not to blame for the evils people commit. The evil things that people do go against Jesus' instructions. Jesus taught us to love people and to treat others the way we would like to be treated. For example, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. In other words, if you want people to be friendly and kind and forgiving with you, Jesus would say, well, then you be friendly. You be kind. You be forgiving with them. We call this the golden rule. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, Jesus said, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Imagine how much better off the world would be today if more people did this. So while religious people have certainly caused some suffering, let's not lay any of the blame for the world's evils at Jesus' feet. A second thing commonly overlooked when people blame the world's suffering on religious people is this. Atheists and non-religious people have caused a lot of suffering as well. Richard Dawkins doesn't like to point that out in his books. He'll bring up examples of child molesting priests and, you know, some people in the, who claim to be Christians who did some awful things. But what about Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, and Mao Zedong who murdered as many as 100 million people in just a few decades of the 20th century? That's far more than those who were put to death by theists of any stripe over the past 500 years. So it just isn't true that religions are responsible for most of the world's wars and suffering, especially Christianity. 
All right, last one. It's a fact, our friend says, that humans are the product of evolution. Well, this is certainly not the case. There are insurmountable problems with the theory of evolution. I can't get into all of them in our talk this morning, but one fatal blow to the theory of human evolution is the fossil record. The fossil record. If evolution really is the explanation for all of life, the fossil record should show continuous and gradual changes from the bottom layer to the top layers, but it doesn't. Nearly all groups of animals appear in the fossil record suddenly, simultaneously with each other, fully developed and with absolutely no hint that they evolved from anything else. Those facts are devastating to the theory of human evolution. The fossil record is actually evidence for a global flood as recorded in the book of Genesis, not evolution. And the so-called ape men fossils that scientists have continued to try to pass off to the public as proof of human evolution have turned out again and again to be an embarrassment to them. Consider Piltdown Men. In the village of Piltdown, England, an amateur paleontologist found part of a human skull and part of an ape-like lower jaw with two teeth. Scientists hail this discovery as a major missing evolutionary link between apes and humans. For 40 years, it was taught in schools as proof of human evolution until it was exposed as a colossal hoax. 40 years after the bones were put forth as evidence for human evolution, a team of scientists at the University of Oxford proved that the Piltdown skull belonged to a modern human and the jaw fragment belonged to a modern orangutan. It was also discovered that the jaw had been chemically treated to make it look like a fossil and its feet, is, its feet, <laughs> its teeth, don't put your feet in your mouth like I just did, um, its teeth had been deliberately filed down to make them look human. Piltdown Man was a forgery, but it was in the textbooks for 40 years. Sorry, kids. <laughs> but what about Neanderthal Man? You probably grew up hearing about Neanderthal Man as proof of human evolution. It was again taught to school children for decades that this was proof of human evolution. But now, with the help of DNA technology, we've learned that Neanderthals were just humans not ape men or even ancestors of modern humans, just humans. Uh, but what about Nebraska man? Nebraska man, as depicted in this artistic propaganda, was based on a discovery of a single tooth in a field in Nebraska. Pretty incredible what someone can draw based on a single tooth, isn't it? You'd walk by the museum exhibit and see that artwork and think they must have found the whole village and tools and bones and all kinds of stuff. No, just, just one tooth. Well, again, they sold this off to the public as more proof of human evolution until scientists years later came along and re-examined the tooth and found out that the tooth belonged to a pig. <laughs> Wasn't related to humans at all. What about Lucy? Unearthed in Ethiopia, a collection of fossilized bones was boldly proclaimed as the ancestor of all humanity in newspapers, textbooks, on television shows, and in museums. But evolutionary researchers have more recently concluded that she should no longer be considered a direct ancestor of humans. Surprise, surprise. How about one more? Ida. The press hailed the fossilized remains named Ida as the missing link in human evolution. Check out that headline there. And they even called it the eighth wonder of the world. But Ida was more recently and quietly, it's always, always a big splash when it's introduced to the public and then quietly pulled down years later. Ida was more recently reclassified as a small tailed extinct primate and ancestor, not of humans at all, but of lemurs. Lemurs. Oops. <laughs> Friends, the fossil record has been and always will be an embarrassment to the theory of human evolution. And we know why. You are not the product of millions of years of mutations and evolution. We were created by God. 
Your human body with its 206 bones, more than 600 muscles, and a heart that beats more than 100,000 times a day as it pumps about 75 gallons of blood an hour through more than 60,000 miles of veins, arteries, and capillaries in your body shouts design from top to bottom. Friend, you are fearfully and wonderfully made by a loving creator. That's the truth of the matter. And God created you so that you might know him and enjoy a relationship with him here in this life and throughout eternity in his heavenly kingdom. That's why Jesus, God in the flesh, died on the cross. Because of his great love for you, the Bible says he died there in your place to suffer the judgment you deserve for your sins so that you could be forgiven so that you could be rescued from spending eternity in hell and be brought back into a right relationship with your maker. But three days later, Jesus walked out of that grave and today he offers all humanity the forgiveness of sins, peace with God, and the free gift of everlasting life in his eternal kingdom. That is great news. <laughs> we, don't, we don't deserve any of that. We deserve judgment. And condemnation, and God says, Actually, I've got something way better for you. Everlasting life, peace with God, total forgiveness of all your sins. What a gracious offer God has made humanity. How do you lay hold of that offer? Jesus said, Whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's it. God's done all the work. He just wants you now to place your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross, and you can do that today. God's a prayer away. You can call it to him this morning before you walk out of this place and just pray something like, God, thank you for loving me. Please forgive me for my sins. I renounce them and turn away from them, and I trust in Jesus Christ to save me. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. If you'll call out to the Lord like that, the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So don't put it off. Get right with God today while you still have air in your lungs. For the rest of you who have already done that, as I know most of you have, may the God of heaven and earth empower and embolden you to share the gospel with people and when necessary to contend earnestly for the faith as we're told to do in Jude verse 3.